listening to B2B Tech Talk with Ingram Micro, the place to learn about new technology and technological advances before they become mainstream. This podcast is sponsored by Ingram Micro's Imagine Next. It's not about the destination. It's about going someplace you never thought possible. Go to imaginenext.ingrammicro.com to find out more. Let's get into it. Welcome to B2B Tech Talk with Ingram Micro. I'm your host, Shelby Skirhawk. And my guest today is Patrick Smith, technology consultant for Ingram Micro. Patrick, welcome. Thanks, Shelby. Glad to be here. Excellent. Well, today we're talking about something a little different than usual. We're talking about social media, kind of society, and this concept of soulful work. So uh, Trellis CEO, Brian Palma, he, he spoke at an October 2021 uh, a tech conference that uh, about a topic that really seemed more TED Talk than tech talk. And uh, it was this idea of, you know, soulless to soulful work. So if you would kind of introduce us to that that conversation, that speech that he gave uh, and what he meant by, you know, soulless to soulful work. Sure. Uh, so Brian started off by saying that social media has become a destructive force in our lives. And I agree with Brian 100%. I've witnessed firsthand many of the destructive capabilities of social media, and maybe you've experienced them also, but it seems like users can hide behind the anonymity of a screen name, and they think they could do or say whatever they want without any repercussions, whether it's cyberbullying, hate speech, threats of violence, and just think about the impact that these actions have on our youth, right? Their actions cause anxiety, depression, and so many other social disorders with our youth. Now, social media was first developed and promoted as a platform that could help unite us, right? But today, it's actually divided us, literally tearing friends and families apart. And the challenge is that many of these social media companies are not doing enough to protect our children from these activities. They're not doing enough to protect our teenagers, our adults, and even the elderly. Now, the fact is social media companies are more concerned about their profits from selling advertising statistics about their users than actually protecting them from harm. And this is what is described as soulless work. Now, my heart actually goes out to the employees of these social media companies. And Brian states it perfectly in his discussion when he says, and let me, let me just quote this, founded on the promise of bringing the world closer together and fostering community, these companies attracted countless smart, talented people who wanted to be part of that very mission. And he goes on to say, but many of these employees have come to the realization that social media often does more to sever than to unite. Working for these companies no longer align with their values. And as a result, they're leaving their jobs in droves. They're in search for most soulful work, work they could be proud of, work that offers them a higher purpose, work providing a chance to change the world, work like cybersecurity, and that's the end quote. So, you know, and quite honestly, with the current cybersecurity talent shortage, there's a huge opportunity for some of these employees to go from that soulless work to more of a soulful work. And that's really the, the premise of, of that uh, the RSA conference speech. Yeah. Well, I understand that you actually, in your in your background, you had kind of headed up a a cybersecurity for kids type of educational program. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, so I'm actually, you know, over the past 10 years, I've had the distinct pleasure of volunteering within my local and surrounding communities by providing presentations for students and parents on three very important topics. Computer security, which is, you know, talking about keeping your stuff safe. Online security, which is keeping our kids safe while online. And I think the most important, you know, cyber ethics, and that is how to behave and act responsibly while on the internet. Now I've been lucky enough to present this message of online safety to over 3000 students, teachers and parents at venues like summer camps, 
Boy Scout meetings, church youth organizations, and even local elementary schools. And if it's not readily apparent, I really enjoy doing this kind of social work. Now, parents can do it too, right? So I, I encourage you to start right now by opening up the lines of communications, by having discussions with your kids about understanding the dangers and clearly identifying the potential risks that are involved with the child's online activities. Now, I get it. You know, some parents are not so tech savvy and maybe could use a little help, right? So I have a couple of resources with uh, having these these uh, discussions with the children. The first is the National Cybersecurity Alliance. And their website is staysafeonline.org. There's a lot of digital resources available for parents, things like tip sheets on how to have that talk with your kids, videos, articles, and so much more. Another resource is FBI SOS program. And SOS just stands for Safe Online Surfing. And their website is sos.fbi.gov. The SOS program is free educational program for children that teaches uh, cyber safety that helps them to become digital citizens in a fun and engaging way, right? So there's a lot of fun activities for the kids. Parents and kids can use the SOS website at home at any time. Just visit sos.fbi.gov and pick the appropriate grade level and go learn together, or should I say, go learn some soulful work together. And uh, you'd also mentioned, you know, we uh, had a previous discussion about this topic, uh, kind of preparing for this episode. And uh, you mentioned that you're part of the FBI InfoGuard, uh, which is a, a voluntary organization that's kind of dedicated to to pushing this message forward about cybersecurity, safety. Tell us a little bit about that and, and, and why then this all connects, because you are, you know, obviously very well informed and, you know, deeply connected to this topic of online security and safety. So then it's become your kind of soulful work to, uh, to, to do this. I guess, tell us a little bit about that, uh, that program. Yeah, absolutely. So the FBI InfraGuard is a collaboration between the FBI and cybersecurity professionals in the public sector, right? So it, it allows us to share threat information with the FBI, and then in turn, they share their threat information with us as well. So it's a great way of really doing research on some of the threats that are available, uh, some of the ways that we can help to prevent some of these threats. And and most importantly, you know, and, and the, the soulful work that I really enjoy doing, like I said, I love volunteering within the communities to help keep you know, our, our kids safe. And, you know, it's been my mantra that, you know, if I can help save the life of one child, it's worth all the time and effort I put into it. So it's, it's a great organization to be part of. Yeah. Well, uh, in that uh, talk by Brian Palma, you know, he said that 70% of, you know, surveyed people believe that social media does more harm than good. 70% is, is a lot. And, and so, you know, it seems, Yes, we know that social media companies I mean they they're they're not nonprofits certainly. They are there to uh to make money, but um why are we focusing very very you know finitely on what companies can do? Because that's the thing is that, you know, social media companies can't necessarily control the actions of of people. There's always going to be somebody that, you know, that that never learned those cyber ethics and and basically does believe that they, you know they they've completely wiped away all of those social mores just by being anonymous and online. But uh, talk to us about why then it's imperative to look at what companies are doing, what the social media companies are doing to keep us safe and secure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you hit the nail right on the head. It's, it's definitely become the wild, wild west, right? People are doing things and saying things. And just they, they feel that, you know, as I've mentioned before, they're doing it be behind the anonymity of a username and they feel that they have no repercussions if, you know, whatever, for whatever they're doing. So, you know, companies are doing a lot of type, a lot of education, right? To help with their cyber security hygiene, if you will, right? Yeah. Making sure that they don't click on every single email or, or link that, that they see come across their, their outlook, making sure that 
you know, they don't, they don't accept uh, random, you know, friend requests or whatever. And, and, you know, that type of cyber hygiene, if they're practicing at home, it's my hope that they bring that cyber hygiene into the workplace and it follows them wherever they're going. So making sure that you know, we're, we're providing adequate training for the users to make sure that they identify, you know, some of the risks that are involved and, you know, how to, how to react to some of those risks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, education, uh, you know, educating people about, you know, what's safe, what's not safe, a little bit of the, the cyber ethics. That concept interests me because it feels like there's etiquette everywhere. And sometimes it's not as obvious to, to some users than others. So for people that maybe don't realize that, that cyber ethics are a thing, that it isn't the wild, wild west, that we do have social mores to follow. And, and you know, just like we taught or we learned that you don't go, you know, shouting things at all cats, you know, there's also a kind of a, 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 a element of these ethics in cyber social media, security, uh, hygiene, all of those things that you're talking about. So, Tell us a little bit about why Trellix is particularly involved with this idea of educating people to uh, what's important to keep an eye on, what's important of what you click on, how you click on it, where you are in social media, I guess, how you're, how you're being a digital citizen. Sure. I mean, and, you know, the, the whole point of, you know, training the employees is to make sure that they're trying to eliminate or I shouldn't say eliminate, but you know, reduce the amount of risk that are that's going to be coming from their actions. I, I think I remember seeing so like 90% of the types of threats that we get within our organizations are because of something that the end user did. You know, whether they clicked on an email, clicked on a link, did something, there's there's some type of action that the user did. And that's the reason why we have so many threats that are in, in, involved with our environments, right? So the more education that we could do to help prevent them from, you know, from having these risks come in the first place uh, helps you to just mitigate the, the, those risks in the first place. Right, right. So you mentioned the uh, the cybersecurity professionals out there. We already know that there has been a huge talent shortage out there and it's been even more evident within the you know the cybersecurity industry just because you know things have never been more critical yet it's uh it's very difficult for uh for companies to hire let alone retain these uh professionals that are really the the first line of defense a lot of times against the risks and harm that is out there Explain a little bit about that, about this cybersecurity talent gap. Absolutely. So according to a recent cybersecurity workforce study, there's an estimated 3.4 million cybersecurity worker shortage in 2022. Now, in the U.S. alone, that's more than 700,000 unfilled cybersecurity jobs. So what can we do to fill these soulful cybersecurity positions, right? That's the question we get all the time. Uh, first, we need to you know get our youth excited about cybersecurity and technology. I'm really excited and, and really encouraged by all of the STEM programs that are out there currently being offered to our youth, right? I'm really encouraged by seeing more and more cybersecurity programs that are being offered by colleges and, and universities. So that's, that's a good start. But what we really need help in is getting in front of these students more, talking about the benefits of cybersecurity. And of course, as I mentioned before, you know, one of the the side benefits of this is starting off young with what I like to call, you know, good cyber hygiene. Hopefully that will, you know, follow them whenever they start to begin, you know, working in their respective fields, right? Secondly, we need to continue promoting a more diverse and inclusive work environment. Now, I'm a firm believer that everyone is capable of having that million dollar idea, right? Regardless of their education regardless of their age, regardless of their, their race, or regardless of whatever, right? Everyone has the ability to draw from their own cultural experiences and help to foster and, and become more innovative within the working place. So everyone you know, needs a chance at soulful work. And lastly, companies that help to provide trainings and workshops or, or whatever else that, that need to promote within their own company, right? There's a lot of 
wonderful cybersecurity trainings that are available. Matter of fact, Ingram Micro, for example, uh, provides access to a huge library of LinkedIn learning v- videos and courses. And that really helps to, you know, to help people from promoting within. Uh, employees can also take advantage of educational assistant programs uh, that are available to help equip them for any type of you know, future open sec- cybersecurity positions within the company. So to connect the dots here, soulless work are often soulless companies that are putting profits over not just security, but, you know, somewhat, you know, that because some of the blatant harm that is taking place out there, we have seen that, uh, especially young professionals, they realize that, you know, if they don't believe in a mission, if they don't believe in the work that they're doing, they're just not going to do it. And that's not a, a statement of, you know, well, I don't want to do this. It's, you know, you need to know that what you're doing matters. And so if that is the idea of soulful work, then what is the, I guess, what's the call to action then? If, you know, for somebody that is doing soulless work, that doesn't believe in the work that they're doing, that doesn't believe that the company that they're working for is taking those harms seriously, how do you transition? How how do you find a career that gives you that satisfaction that, okay, I am doing soulful work. I'm doing work that makes a difference and is important. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I, matter of fact, when I was young, I had a, a, a teacher that said, if you find something that you enjoy doing, you're never going to have to work another day in your life. And, you know, finding something that you, that you enjoy, cybersecurity is something that I, I actually enjoy. And, you know, and, and I help companies, I help people, I help kids to stay out of trouble, really. And, and that really, to me, is very satisfying. So that's my soulful work, right? And I would suggest, you know, do, and do your research. You know, there's tons of research, resources that are available on what soulful work is, right? Matter of fact, uh, www.soulfulwork.com. It's a great place to start to learn more about, you know, what is meant by doing soulful work. Um, and if you haven't done so already, I'd highly recommend that you watch the RSA presentation by Brian Palma on, uh, and, and it's, it's titled Soulless to Soulful, Security's Chance to Save Tech, right? And it's actually inspired me to continue on with the conversation of doing soulful work. So thank you, Brian, for that. Uh, there's also a LinkedIn hashtag, so you can subscribe to soulful work posts with, yes, you guessed it, hashtag soulful work. So there's, there's a lot of resources that are out there available to help you learn more about soulful work and see if that's something that you want to do. Got it. Got it. I'm curious. Uh, do, you, do you have kids yourself, Brian? I'm after Brian. <laughs> I, I, I feel, like, I, feel <laughs> like I am getting that. Uh, yeah, that's right from the, the source. Let's try that again. Uh, so do you have uh, kids yourself, Patrick? I do. So actually, they're older. So they're 30 and 32. But I do have three grandkids. You know, they're three, five, and, and 12, respectively. So luckily, I've I've gotten past you know I I got the thirty and the thirty two year old past you know the whole yeah they didn't thing. grow up with no, social did they no they did not but it's, it's the grandkids that really scare them to death you know just what they're going to be faced you know from an internet perspective over the next couple of years it just it just scares me right and and that's that's really what drives me to help to teach these kids on you know what are some of the risks that are available out there. And how to stay safe and to make sure that those, those threats don't happen to them. So that, that's really why I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm striving to, to, to do this type of soulful work. So it really drives me. Right. Right. You know, with regards then to, uh, to some of the more harmful social media forms and, and activities that our youth are really being exposed to all the time. What can we do to protect our families? What are some of the things that, you, especially in your own house and, and, you know, and grandchildren's homes really drive home for them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like I said before, you know, some of the, uh, the activities that even parents can do with their kids and, and whether it's, you know, finding somebody that provides these type of online safety for kids trainings, or if you want to try it yourself, you know, there's, there's a lot of resources available. Like I said, you know, staysafeonline.org as well as the sos.fbi.gov. Those are some really, really nice websites that you can actually sit down with your kids and go through the program with them and, and help to open those lines of communication 
up with the children. The biggest thing is, is a lot of parents think they know what their kids are doing online. And there's a huge gap between what they think that their kids are doing online and what they're actually doing online. And the more that we can educate ourselves with, you know, th- these are these are the threats that are out there, the better that we, we can protect them, right? Because there are so many applications, and I hate to say this, but there's applications out there that the kids know how to hide some of their online activities. As a matter of fact, there's a calculator app that yes. you know, it looks just like a calculator, but if the the kid types in a certain uh, formula, whether it's you know three divided by one or whatever, um, they it unlocks a certain portal where they can hide some of their chat usage and their, some of their their videos and their their posts and is this it's just crazy that the, these these applications are even available. So the the more that we can educate parents, the better that we can help to you know protect the kids and, and other things too. Just you know things like don't allow the kid to have a computer that's out of sight, right? Have, have it in a visible someplace that has high traffic. Because uh, the last thing you want to do is, you know, you're walking by and all of a sudden you see the, the screen shrink. Yeah. Maybe something's going on, right? So making sure that it, it's it's visible to everybody within the family and just have those conversations of, you know, what what is stranger danger? You know, people that are asking to be your friends may not be who they're really you know, saying that they are. So just be careful with that and, and just know all the different things like that. And there, there's so many resources that are available to help keep our kids safe. And, and like I said, that's just something that, that um, I'm, I, I really love doing that type of slow work. Yeah. Well, really interesting discussion, an important discussion to have then. So as we do start to wrap up. Well, let me ask you quickly. You know, you've mentioned some source some resources that uh, that people can go to for uh, for more information. Are there other places that uh, you know that parents and you know people can turn to for for a start in, in educating themselves? Yeah, absolutely. So they could reach out to me directly. I I'd be more than happy to to guide them to any type of resources. You, I may have even some resources that that I could share with you know some of the parents, some of the, the educators, perhaps. Reach out to me at patrick.smith at ingramicro.com. More than happy to help out. Excellent. As we do wrap up our episode, uh, we also ask our guests the same final question, and that's where do you see technology going in the next year? So as we uh, start to wrap up our year and come into 2023, where are we going to be, Patrick? Sure. I mean, here at Ingram Micro, we have a center of excellence. And our team has a list of several key security trends, uh, things like you know security frameworks, zero trust networks. Uh, so you might have heard of SASE, which is Secure Access Service Edge, uh, CASB, Cloud Access Security Broker, just to name a few, right? And these and, and many other key security trends are actually listed on our Ingram Micro Security Line Card at securitylinecard.com. And by the way, if you haven't already seen the security line card, it's an awesome resource that highlights the various security solutions that are available from Ingram Micro and matches each of these security offerings to their corresponding NIST cybersecurity framework classifications, which happen to be identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Excellent. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for uh, for the discussion today. I really appreciate all the insight. It's my, my pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you listeners for tuning in and subscribing to B2B Tech Talk with Ingram Micro. If you like this episode or have a question, please join the discussion on Twitter with the hashtag B2B Tech Talk. Until next time, I'm Shelby Skirhawk. You've been listening to B2B Tech Talk with Ingram Micro. This episode was sponsored by Ingram Micro's Imagine Next. B2B Tech Talk is a joint production with Sweetfish Media and Ingram Micro. Ingram Micro production handled by Laura Burton and Christine Fan. To not miss an episode, subscribe today on your favorite podcast platform.